The United States Army Corps of Engineers is adding a revolutionary piece of equipment to its inventory, the floating nuclear power plant Sturgis, designated MH-1A. As construction of this unique, highly mobile power plant neared completion, non-nuclear dockside testing of the ship, its equipment and its systems began. Construction of the ship is described in part one of this two-part film. In this second part, you will see the highlights of the dockside tests conducted at the shipyard. Upon completion of these tests, the MH-1A was towed to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where the reactor will be fueled and a 60-day endurance test will be completed. At that time, the power plant and its crew will have demonstrated operational readiness for their mission. Supply of 10,000 kW of electric power with a minimum of logistic support. Testing to be made fully effective and meaningful was formalized by test specifications, detailed written procedures, and complete documentation of test results. The tests conducted to ensure proper operation and safety of equipment range from simple tests of lighting to the complex and highly technical control rod drop time test. The tests were performed by the operating crew, a team composed of contractor and military personnel. Participation of the military crew in this early stage of readying the ship for service afforded them practical training to augment their classroom work. Electricity may be called the alpha and omega of this ship. Power must be available to begin operation, and the end product is electrical power in quantity. Therefore, testing the electrical systems was the first order of business. Shore power, not used in normal operation, was employed for these tests. Availability of power is assured by redundant sources. The auxiliary diesels furnish reactor startup power, and the reactor furnishes ship's power thereafter. If power on the normal 450 volt bus is lost, one of the auxiliary diesels automatically starts and restores essential power. At the same time, the emergency diesel starts, ensuring power to the emergency bus. If the diesels fail to start, the station battery takes over to supply vital power to instruments and controls. The electrical tests proved by power loss simulation that all of the substitutes on this team are ready to step in for the regulars. Power for lighting is assured by an emergency system that automatically takes over if the normal system fails. Communication, essential to operation of the plant, is provided by the dial telephone system, the public address system, and the sound-powered telephone net. In addition to being tested themselves, these communication systems played a major role in tests of other equipment and systems. Instrumentation and its indications, the nerve system of the plant, were tested and calibrated by application of simulated conditions to the sensors and checking instruments for proper response. For example, controlled and varied pressure was applied to the pressurizer pressure transmitter. And the correct response of the pressurizer pressure indicator was verified. Similar means were employed to test other instrumentation and alarm systems. The temperature monitoring system, the enunciator panel, and alarms on the waste disposal panel. The work thus far laid the groundwork for testing equipment and larger systems. Diesel tests began with the operation of fuel oil and lubricating oil purifiers and pumps for four hours, with oil transfer being conducted. The emergency hand pumps were also checked for satisfactory operation. This was not a four-hour operation. Cooling water flow to the engines was adjusted and the compressed air system for diesel starting and ship services was operated for four hours to prove proper operation and a leak-free system. The diesels were started by the operator, and then automatic start in response to loss of bus was checked. Synchronizing and paralleling of one of the two generators with the other was also checked. The test of the main circulating system began with opening the traveling screen well bulkhead doors and the water intake doors in the side of the hull. The traveling screens, which removed debris from the water, were started. 
and the screen sprays, which wash debris overboard, were put into operation. These huge butterfly valves in the 30-inch main circulating system intake and discharge pipes were opened in preparation for circulation of the water. And one of the 25,000 GPM pumps was started. These two pumps were operated successively for four hours each. Growth of marine organisms in the main circulating system is controlled by addition of chlorine to the water. The chlorinating system and main circulating system tests were performed concurrently. Since all dockside testing was non-nuclear, the reactor was not fueled, steam needed for certain tests was supplied by the boilers of an obsolete ship moored alongside the MH-1A. Using this external steam source, the turbine generator was turned, and the steam turbine-driven main feed pump and lubricating oil pump were operated for four hours. The steam was also employed to check operation of the main air ejector, the turbine generator gland seal system, and the intricate maze of piping and valves that make up each of the several pressure-reducing stations. As in normal operation, steam from the turbine generator discharged to the main condenser. The condensate was removed from the main condenser by the condensate pumps and delivered to the main air ejector condensers, to the first stage heater, and then to the deaerator. From the deaerator, the condensate is fed to the steam generator in normal operation. However, for this test, it was returned to the test boiler feed tank. Before the hot loop test was conducted, primary system hydrostatic and helium leak tests proved system integrity. Pressures up to 2625 PSI, nearly twice operating pressure, were employed. The obsolete ship also supplied steam for the hot loop test. The normal reactor coolant to feed water heat exchange in the steam generator was reversed for this test. The steam was introduced to the shell side of the generator and heated the reactor coolant. The 24-hour hot loop test checked piping for leaks. Operation of the pressurizer and pressure relief system. The purification and decay heat removal system. The buffer seal system. And operation of various system pumps. The hot loop test introduced heat into the containment vessel. Extraction of this heat by the containment cooling system proved the system's effectiveness. Concurrently with the hot loop test, the control rod alignment and position indication were verified. Safety was the watchword in design, construction, and testing of the ship. The nuclear plant containment vessel is a prime example of the embodiment of that watchword. To ensure that the vessel will prevent release of contamination to the atmosphere, the vessel was pressurized and checked for leaks. However, before pressurization began, isolation valves were closed, components were vented, and other precautions were taken, such as removal of fragile items to prevent damage. The vessel was pressurized to 25 PSIG, and a soap solution was used to check for small leaks. Integrity of the vessel was thus proven. The vessel will be again tested at higher pressures after the tow to Fort Belvoir to assure that stresses of ocean travel will not affect the vessel. The vessel will be subsequently tested annually or whenever the top hatch is opened. All primary plant pumps were operated for at least four hours to ensure proper operation. Some of these pump tests were performed as part of system tests. Others consisted only of the pump check. Refueling, although only an annual occurrence, is a critical procedure, one in which no hitches can be afforded. Therefore, the dockside tests included a thorough check of the functioning of special refueling equipment and remotely operated tools. The refueling room crane is the workhorse of the refueling operation. Its operation in all planes of motion was checked, and then it was load tested first with a certified 2,500 pound weight, and then with a 51,000 pound weight. Other functional tests included those of the refueling shield tank, 
which during refueling is filled with water to cover the reactor for radiation protection, the fuel element handling tool, the control rod handling tool, structure, the nut handling tool, other devices to be used in refueling. The steam generator has 5% more tube surface than needed for operation. Therefore, tube leaks may be repaired by plugging tubes up to 5% of total tube area without affecting operation. The capability of performing tube plugging was verified. Rigging was installed to aid in opening the 500 pound manway cover. Studs were removed and the cover was opened. Then the baffle plate inside the generator was removed. And use of the tube plugging tools was simulated. Tests of the provisions for life aboard ship were not overlooked. Both the primary plant and the secondary plant contain numerous heat exchangers. Typical is the purification cooler. In addition to the usual four hour pump runs, Flow rates were set for the cooling water system serving these heat exchangers. Tests of other secondary plant and ship service systems included those of the bilge and ballast system, the potable water system, and the makeup feed system. Fire protection equipment was thoroughly checked and demonstrated. The fresh water and salt water firefighting systems the CO2 firefighting system, the smoke detecting system, and the fire alarm system. The warping capstans were tested at 20,000 pounds for effective brake action. The anchor windlass was power operated to check the machinery, the chains, and the anchors. The remotely controlled watertight bulkhead doors were operated. And the steering gear was cycled. The deck cranes were put through their paces to demonstrate readiness for their jobs. Other ship's equipment that was checked included the navigating light indicator panel, the whistle, the remotely controlled searchlight on the pilot house, and the manually positioned searchlight on the aft upper deck. The bridge signaling light was directed on a receiving station to test remote keying operation. The power driven accommodation ladder was operated and timed to ensure compliance with requirements. Particular emphasis was placed on testing life-saving equipment. 
life rafts, life preservers, lifeboats and handling equipment. The boats were swung out from the chocks and lowered to the embarkation position at the level of the upper deck. Water, totaling 6,600 pounds, was put in the boats to prove operation under overload conditions. The overload was 10% of the weight normally carried, plus 10% of the weight of the boat. With this overload, the boats were lowered by gravity with stops every six feet, using only the handbrake. Thus, the capability of launching boats, if there is no power aboard the ship, was assured. When the boat reached the water, it was disengaged from the floating block and was then reattached to the box. This first test was conducted with dry equipment. To prove that bad weather will not affect operation, the test was repeated with the handling equipment wetted down. At completion of the tests, the weight was removed and the boat was returned to its stowed position. The final step in the program was the incline test, conducted under supervision of the United States Coast Guard to determine the ship's center of gravity. Weights were placed along the rail to incline the ship. Pendulums and instruments indicated the degree of incline, and from the data thus obtained, the center of gravity was determined. Her tests completed, the ship needed only her cosmetics, cleaning, and the final paint touch-ups to be ready for her first voyage. As a result of the tests, there was assurance that all equipment and systems covered by the dockside tests were complete, functioned properly, and provided maximum safety. With this assurance, the MH-1A departed her birthplace, bound for the last major step before going on active duty, operational testing at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. <laughs>